you're joining us at what's been a very tumultuous month, you can see and say. And what we've seen in the banking sector, both in the U.S. and in Europe, do you have any concerns that could spill over to the asset management industry? Yeah, Katie, it's a great question. Thank you for having me. It's been a, quite a busy time at, at Janice Anderson. Um, look, I, I think a couple things. I think the, the, the chart that Scarlett just put up there is a really important chart for asset management overall. You're exactly right. Money is no longer free. And what had happened over the past 10 or 12 years is that you know money was free, and, and so good companies or bad companies really didn't make a difference in terms of whether they were successful or not. Today and going forward, I don't know what rates are going to be five years from now. I do know it'll be more than they were in the past 10 or 12 years. Picking those good companies versus those bad companies, the haves and have-nots, is going to be the way you make alpha in the business, the way you actually differentiate and deliver for our clients and their clients really good returns. So just sticking to an index, just looking at the chart you put up, Scarlett, and just saying, look, I'm just going to blanketly go into the equities world is really going to be quite difficult because nothing's free anymore. Some bad companies will not survive. They can't just continue to draw on free cash. And differentiating the haves and the have-not companies is going to be the name of the game going forward. And, and frankly, that's, that's what we do at Janice Henderson. I was just meeting with our, our equity team in Denver, for example. Mm. These people know the underlying companies better than anybody else I've met. They understand the business. And that's really what's going to drive for our clients the benefit of the next few years. And to stick with what we're seeing in the banking sector just a little bit longer, obviously in Credit Suisse's shake up that uh, government brokered takeover from UBS, do you see any opportunities to hire asset management executives from Credit Suisse? Um, so not Credit Suisse specifically. We're always looking to build a continue to build a world class business uh, for us. There, there's plenty of talent out there. You just put up some uh, numbers around what happened to people's bonuses. Uh, we're certainly investing in our business, and and the way we think about it, Janice Henderson is not for the short term, but for the long term, let's invest in our business. That's a lot about people. It's a people business, as they say, and it really is true. We're trying to hire the best people we can and bring them in. You mentioned the 40 to $45 million cost savings target that we put out there. Guess what we're doing? We're investing all of that back in the business, mm -hmm. all of that back in the business on behalf of our clients. Right? A client doesn't really care if your margins are 28% or 28.5%. Right? As long as you're a going concern, you have a good balance sheet, you're OK. They want to make sure they get the best client service, the best performance from a stock perspective as they possibly can, from a fixed income perspective, from alternatives. That's what we're all about. We're investing in the business counter-cyclically for the long term because of our clients. And because of your clients, you talk a lot about how you need to give them what they want now as opposed to back in the day when you could just close your eyes and put money into the indexes and everything would go up. Clients want solutions. They don't just want mere performance anymore. Are asset management firms as currently constructed able to anticipate their needs? And how are their needs different now that cash is no longer free? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's a question that everybody in asset management is struggling with. We, for example, are building up a solutions business exactly to tackle that. What we found for ourselves, and I've seen other asset management companies do this as well, is that bits and pieces scarlet of the solution. But the solutions don't come together because we don't ask the very simple question of our clients and our clients' clients, what do you need? Mm -hmm. Right? We say, here's what we have. No, that's not the right question to ask anymore, particularly, as you mentioned, to the chart you showed, in this environment where things are not free, right? and we have to understand what the objectives are of those clients. That's exactly what we're focused on, whether it be based on the Denver equities business that we have, or the fixed income business that we have, or the multi-strat business that we have. And there are really big themes that are happening in the industry right now, broadly from an investment perspective. We have to make sure we capitalize that and package that for our clients and our clients' clients. Are clients telling you that they need and want more private credit, private equity? Um, they are, right? I, I think, uh, particularly on the private credit side, mm -hmm. there's a significant need there. Um, it's something where you've been looking at for quite some time to build off of the foundation that we have and the equities and the fixed income traditional businesses that we have. Private equity, I'd argue, um, there's a little bit of a trepidation right now, uh, particularly around the real estate part of things. Uh, we, you've all talked about the CRE world and what's happened with regional banks, for sure. We're seeing that as well. I think what's happened is, um, look, we're all talking about inflation right now from a CPI perspective. What people forget perhaps is, again, it's because money was free, the asset costs were clearly going up. There's clear inflation in asset prices in the private markets, and private equity, for better or for worse, got the benefit of that. I'm not sure it's going to be quite as easy going forward. I mean, there was a lot of money in the private equity landscape uh, that was not very thoughtful in terms of where they put the money to use because they had to put it in play. They had to actually put it into a company. And there was a lot of money at play, too. There's tons of money, Scarlett. Exactly right. And, and so, look, your, your diligence might have been, your diligence list might have been a little shorter when you have money to put out there than it should have been. 
that's not for all private equity, but there really will be a haves and have nots within private equity within the public markets as well. What we do think, take real estate for example, there is a real differential between the public market prices of real estate, REITs for example, and privates. We think that gap has to close over time and for our clients we want to be able to take advantage of that for them. And I want to talk a little bit about the vehicle in which you're delivering these strategies. I cover ETFs, so you know that's my natural question: is which strategies, which wrappers are you pursuing right now? If I look at Janice Henderson right now, I see you have 12 ETFs, which about with about six billion dollars in assets under management. Are you considering expanding that arm of the business as you think about the path forward? Yeah, it's a great question, Katie. So yes is the short answer. The little bit longer answer is we have fantastic investment capabilities. I mentioned, again, Denver equities. I mentioned London equities, Asia equities across the world, fixed income, uh, some, some parts on the alternative side as well. If the client wants it green or the client wants it blue, we should be able to deliver that to them. Right? ETS for sure is a big part of our business. It's been a very fast growing part of our business. Uh, we have things like JAAA that are out there that have crossed uh, several billion dollars in terms of AUM there, which is one of the fastest growing ETFs out there. It's a CLO ETF. We have others out there as well. $2.5 billion. $2.5 billion. Um, so we also have things that um, are thing in SMA form, in CIT form, in, in mutual fund forms. Classically mutual fund forms are still in great demand. We just want to make sure we're client led in the vehicles that we provide. At its core, the differentiation to us is that investment acumen that we can bring to bear to deliver, particularly in this environment of the has and have nots actually mattering. All right, final question to you uh, here. What's the single most important thing that clients are telling you that surprised you as you take stock of everyone's sentiment and mood of following all the turmoil? Yeah, look, I think, I think it was really two things, if I might. The first one was, um, given what's happened with yields, this idea that we never really contemplated for the past 10 or 12 years in the asset management industry, which is cash, is a competitor. Mm. Now, put aside what happened with SVB and CS and kind of the risks associated there if you're above 250, $250,000 FDIC limit, but cash is a real competitor for us right now. And that's something that wasn't really in our thought processes, for sure. The second one goes a little bit to your earlier question, which is, I want an outcome. I can understand how you can create ingredients to bring me that outcome, but I want an outcome. I don't really, really care how you do it, mm. as long as you can paint me a picture that gets me to that outcome. That's particularly through, tr true for some of the pension plans, who, to your earlier question, are probably overexposed to some of the private markets mm. and have an opportunity to get into the public markets at a lower valuation to close that gap.